His main project was a biopic about Howard Hughes. Bringing this biography of this eccentric millionaire's life to the screen had been a director's dream for the last 40 years. In the late 90s, Michael Mann decided to take up the project and chose Leonardo DiCaprio for the leading role. But after completing two biographies in a row, namely The Insider and Ali, the director lost the desire to do another. In 2002, two directors immediately jumped on the opportunity. The first was Christopher Nolan, who had just finished filming Insomnia and was planning to shoot a story about Howard starring Jim Carrey. They were already six months into production when Nolan found out that a similar project had already been approved by Miramax, with Martin Scorsese at the helm. <laughs> the director had to abandon the idea and began working on Batman. Nice. That's right. Scorsese got the script from Mann, and DiCaprio was immediately interested. He explained to me when I gave him the script that he knew nothing about aviation. But he also said, I did Raging Bull and I knew nothing about boxing. Author John Logan had already conquered the world with Gladiator and adapted the less popular Time Machine, but The Aviator was of an entirely different nature. It was a deep story about an eccentric figure in the golden age of Hollywood. Martin was intrigued by the topic, the script, and of course the chance to work with his favorite young talent. Well, we'll make it. Take care of that, would you? Leonardo had been dreaming of the role for five years at that point, even going so far as to attach his own recently opened studio, Appian Way Productions, to the film. The plot was based on the book Howard Hughes' The Untold Story, but underwent some significant changes. Logan wrote 18 versions of the script. The budget was again provided by Weinstein, $110 million. We don't care about money here, Mr. Hughes. Well, that's because you have it. Sure, previous collaborations with the producer hadn't exactly been smooth sailing, but Harvey was the only one who had agreed to finance the expensive film, which carried no guarantee of success at the box office. Welcome to Hollywood. Yeah. His only condition was that the project's timeline could not be exceeded. Scorsese signed the contract, but ultimately didn't keep his word and personally paid out $500,000 for the violation. Where did all that money go? Well, it went into the plane, Senator. The director was especially interested in the story's visual aspect, so selecting the right cinematographer was critical. The first candidate was Janusz Kaminski, Steven Spielberg's permanent companion. But Kaminski was already preparing to work on The Terminal, so Scorsese turned to his old acquaintance, Robert Richardson, with whom he had filmed Casino and Bringing Out the Dead. What are your colors? Stop fishing. <laughs> Together, they came up with a unique video sequence. Each year in the film corresponded to the coloring personalities of films in those times. The film's first scene mimicked Cinecolor, an early technology of color cinematography. Then came Two-Tone Technicolor. Its distortion can be seen in shots of the golf course and on the table where they appear to be light blue and purple peas. Moving on to auditions. Martin recognized that the famous actresses who constantly surrounded Hughes were key characters. <laughs> Would you do me a favor? Just... Would you just smile for me one time, just once? Gwyneth Paltrow had agreed to play Ava Gardner, but for unknown reasons, she dropped out of the project and was replaced by Kate Beckinsale, who had to gain 20 pounds for the role. You listen to my phone calls. No, 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 honey, I would never do that, I'd never do that. I'd, I'd just read the transcripts, that's all. Gwen Stefani's big screen debut came by complete accident. Scorsese happened to see the actress on the cover of Vogue magazine on the wall of a bus stop. Gwen was posed as Marilyn Monroe, Martin immediately saw his casting match for Jean Harlow and invited her to join the ensemble without even auditioning. You could imagine how excited I was. I mean, obviously an idol of mine, you know, she was the original blonde bombshell. <laughs> thank you. I would like to use this occasion to publicly thank Mr. Hughes for the opportunity he gave me. Thank you. However, casting Kate Blanchett as Katherine Hepburn was always Martin's first and only choice. Good evening, Mr. Hughes. But, um, it's Miss. Miss. Although the actress initially turned down the role due to her parts in the final installment of The Lord of the Rings and The Life Aquatic by Wes Anderson, Martin was planning to replace Kate with Nicole Kidman. But in October of 2003, wildfires hit California and burned down part of the aviator set. Filming was postponed and Blanchett was able to join the cast. Now, Mr. Hughes. If it would be convenient, Miss Hepburn. Scorsese made Kate watch Hepburn's first 15 films, play tennis, golf, and take ice-cold baths. 
which Catherine had made fashionable at the time. That's the trouble. The scope of the aviator was astounding. Over $2 million were spent on costumes alone, and Scorsese's longtime collaborator, Dante Ferretti, rebuilt all of the sets that had been burned down. I dreamed always uh, this period in Hollywood, the most glamour moment in Hollywood in the 30s. I'll build a stairway to paradise with a new step every day. The producers were granted access to Hughes' real mansion, and the new Dial special effects studio designed miniature models of most of the planes used in the film. The Hercules! A plane? A boat? A flying city? Small-scale buildings were also made for the scene where the XF-11 crashes into some houses. Of course, DiCaprio did a deep dive to prepare for this role. He took piloting classes and met with the star of The Outlaw, Jane Russell. Hughes had been the director of that Western film, and the actress was one of the last people to remember the man when he was alive. Leonardo also studied patients with obsessive compulsive disorder, from which Howard also suffered. One of the scenes that we worked on was where uh, Howard Hughes, he had to get blueprints from this other gentleman. Show me all the blue, show me all the blueprints. <laughs> show me all the blueprints. Show me all the blueprints, show me all the blueprints, show me all the blueprints. From what I understand in my research, it has to do with phonetics and the way you say that, to, to have that sentence come out of your mouth the right and perfect way. The attention to detail, visual aesthetics, and breathtaking performance by actors earned The Aviator worldwide critical acclaim. Good. Great. But, once again, it underperformed at the box office. The $200 million it raked in was hardly enough to pay off the film, despite its success at award ceremonies. It's received three Golden Globes, including Best Actor and Best Motion Picture, not to mention 11 Oscar nominations. Thankfully, the mistakes of the past were not to be repeated, but the top prize went to Million Dollar Baby by Clint Eastwood, who received more nominations than Martin for Best Director. A fifth defeat for Scorsese, but The Aviator grabbed five trophies that night, the Academy gave due praise to the visual aspects of the film. I was tempted, tempted by your eyes. I was tempted, the promises, the lies just keep hurting. They just keep on hurting, but I won't be the one to change. Robert Richardson won the award for Best Cinematography, while Dante Ferretti and Sandy Powell each won for Best Art Direction and Best Costume Design. After 25 years, Thelma Schoonmacher also got to celebrate victory once again. As much yours as it is mine, Marty. Uh, not only because you helped me edit the movie, but uh, because you think like an editor when you shoot. And Kate Blanchett received the first Oscar of her career. And on behalf of everyone I know in the aviator, thank you to Martin Scorsese. I hope my son will marry your daughter. Thank you. That same year, Scorsese told the story of another genius. I am a man of cops as I rule. I've seen truth all my The documentary, No Direction Home, Bob Dylan, peers into a five-year period of the musician's life, from the time he moved to New York to a motorcycle accident that caused the artist to go on an eight-year hiatus. I don't want to go nowhere no more. You end up crashing in a private airplane <laughs> in the mountains of Tennessee. And even though the film went unnoticed, it revealed a truthful and heartfelt biography of Dylan's life. Need hundred dollar plates, goodness hides behind its gates, but even the president of the United States sometimes must have to stand naked. Hey, do you like our work? Let us know with your like and comment. Push that subscribe button and share with your friends. If you want to support the project financially, become our sponsor on Patreon or YouTube sponsorship. Thank you.